I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about FCC versus Fox Television Stations Incorporated, a 2009 U.S. Supreme Court case that really sets forth the modern scope of review doctrine. And you should really study this case in conjunction with um, the State Farm and Overton Park cases about um, the judge courts taking a hard look at agency decisions, especially when agencies change their minds or change their policies. And as a quick word before we jump in here, I am gonna focus on the administrative law parts of the case about the standards of review and how the majority opinion handles the State Farm decision. I have a separate video about the State Farm opinion, very important for administrative law. Um, and this is kind of the new interpretation of it. And that's a little bit different than what even I admit courts were doing and what I was taught when I was a law student um, about the meaning of State Farm. The other thing I have to say about this case uh, before we get going is this is a famous case that you may have studied in a First Amendment course or a con law course or something um, because it involves um, censorship and the use of profanity and broadcasts and the federal agencies trying to punish broadcasters for indecency rules. Um, it involves a couple of uh, celebrities from the early 2000s that I'm, I'm not sure will be familiar to um, incoming generations of students, um, but people like reading the case because it's about popular celebrities and um, and people get to say swear words in class, not my class, um, and uh, things like that, and talk about whether we should, the government should have any type of censorship in public broadcasts. And I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about the boring administrative law part. So let's get into the case here. Um, and we're going to start with the statute. We have a federal law, 18 U.S.C. 1464, that bans broadcasting that includes any indecent language. Those are the statutory words. And that includes references to sexual or excretory, that means pooping, um, ac activity or organs. So the Federal Communications Commission is entrusted with implementing and enforcing this statute. And the FCC first defined prohibited speech like this in 1975, in other words, uh, right, we could sit around all day talking about what, what is indecent and um, what counts as indecent. Well, that's the type of thing the FCC is supposed to fill in the gaps and interpret. And so after 1975, it was still pretty cautious because it realized that censorship is going to be politically controversial, but it gradually expanded its approach to enfor enforcing the regulatory prohibition. Um, and you could either see this as the FCC becoming more conservative and politicized, or which is arguably true, um, but you could also see it as the culture was changing. And so in the 50s and 60s and 70s, broadcasters actually didn't want to put, um, uh, to take risks or put uh, profanity or indecency on in their shows, their broadcasts, because they would get boycotted or there would be this public outcry and so forth, and it was a lot of headaches. Well, the culture became much more accepting of um, profanity and, um, and things like that in broadcasts. And so in, in that sense, something about the, this case may actually seem kind of old fashioned and quaint to my Gen Z students. Um, and so part of what had happened between 1975 and the early 90s is the FCC trying to deal with the fact that broadcasters were pushing the boundaries or pushing the limits of what they were allowed to do and taking risks, um, which they wouldn't have done before and kind of daring the FCC to do something. And this had eventually led to something called the Golden Globes Order, where there was a Golden Globes Award where a popular mu musician at the time um, received an award and let out a fleeting expletive, sort of an exhilaration or an excited utterance. Um, and as a result, the FCC issued an order saying that they weren't going to, they didn't consider a single incident of a fleeting expletive um, serious enough to bring in enforcement action, even though they thought that it technically violated the language, but for their purposes, they weren't going to consider it a violation. And 
Um, there's a lot of debate in the case that I'm talking about here, FCC v. Fox, about whether what the Golden Globes order actually said and whether it put people on notice that expletives could constitute a violation. There was a little bit of double talk in the Golden Globes order itself from the FCC in which they basically said, we're not gonna do anything if it's only a pleading expletive, even though we could. And so you could take that how you would. Well, even before they put out that order, let's go to Fox Television. Fox had broadcast the Billboard Music Awards a few times, even before this. And during the 2002 broadcast, a musician who was popular at the time named Cher used an expletive in her acceptance speech. This was very different than the one at the Golden Globes Award, which was sort of this excited utterance. Cher was, um, went on a little rant against her critics and political enemies and so forth, and had used her, her expletive in a scathing sort of attacking way. And then the next year during the Billboard Music Awards, a presenter named Nicole Ritchie, who was in a show that was popular at the time called something like The Simple Life, where she co-starred with Paris Hilton, used a couple of gratuitous expletives, which in some ways was um, in, in role or in character for the character she um, acted out on the show. The um, FCC issued something called notices of liability to Fox for broadcasting the profane language, but it had arguably previously taken the position, maybe in the Golden Globes Award, but definitely in some other informal statements and maybe a couple of other cases that isolated expletives or fleeting utterances would not violate its indecency rules. So the FCC now claimed that both broadcasts violated what it called its new test. Even so, because they were, they recognized that this was sort of new, they didn't impose any sanctions for either broadcast. They didn't find them in this case. So what's really at stake is what the companies can do going forward. Now, this goes to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, and they reversed the FCC's liability order, saying it was arbitrary and capricious. Um, and they said that the FCC had completely reversed its position on fleeting expletives without giving it a proper justification. And by the way, I'm going to talk about this a little later in this video. There's a whole section of the Supreme Court majority opinion that gives painstaking detail to recount the arguments for and against how much did the FCC's position actually change. The FCC is like, no, we haven't actually changed all that much. Our positions evolved a little bit, but it's not that different from the statements we've made in the past. We've just made some inconsistent statements in the past. And other, and of course, the Fox television is saying, oh no, this is out of the blue and something we've never seen before. Now, there's also something here going on here with the circuit courts versus the majority of the Supreme Court. And this is about the famous case, uh, the uh, Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association versus State Farm Insurance. I have a separate video um, that I've made for that. And we study that in administrative law too, the State Farm case. And the a second circuit and other circuit courts had been interpreting State Farm and the Administrative Procedure Act as requiring agencies to articulate why, when, whenever they rescinded a rule or changed their position to articulate why the original reasons for adopting the displaced rule or pol policy are no longer dispositive and why the new rule effectuates the statute as well or better than the old rule. And so in other words, if you're going to abruptly change your rule and reverse course as an agency, you're gonna have to explain um, why the reasons you adopted the old rule that you're abandoning don't apply anymore and why your new rule is at least as good or better. And that's what their takeaway from State Farm was. If you find the State Farm case confusing, keep in mind that the circuit courts and the majority of the Supreme Court here also disagreed about what State Farm stands for. Similarly, the very influential DC Circuit Court of Appeals had been using um, a rule after State Farm that a court standard of review is heightened somewhat when an agency reverses course. And the majority in FCC Fox uh, versus Fox, and this is why the case really matters for administrative law, the majority completely rejects this view and holds that there is no requirement in the APA that all agency change be subjected to a more searching review.
And I want to tell my students that this, what I'm presenting here is, and the majority presents characterizes as the DC circuit and second circuit's view of State Farm is really kind of what I was taught as a, in law school a million years ago. And, um, and so the, this, this is very significant that the majority saying, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, that's not what State Farm ever meant. And that's not what it means now. So the majority here interprets its prior holding in State Farm to mean that rescission of a prior regulation merely requires a reasoned analysis for the change, but not anything beyond that which may be required when an agency does not act in the first instance. And note that Justice Breyer's dissent thinks that State Farm required a lot more than that. Now, let's talk about just for a moment about the Administrative Procedure Act since that's being debated about so much in this case. The APA makes no distinction in, it, uh, in its text between an initial agency action to regulate and a subsequent agency action undoing a prior regulation or revising its earlier actions. And that is true, right? Both are reviewed under the arbitrary and capricious standard and the range of discretion and authority seems to be uh, um, uh, it, that's in its enabling statute. In other words, the agency, whether it's making a new rule out of the blue or contradicting and get, getting rid of an old rule and adopting a new opposite rule. Uh, in either case, according to the APA, all it gives us is arbitrary and capricious and did the agency act in line with um, its enabling statute. And according to the majority, the FCC passes these tests um, in this case. Now, at the same time, the majority reminds us that the requirement that an agency quote, provide a reasonably reasoned ex explanation for its action would ordinarily demand that it display awareness that it is changing its position. In other words, um, the majority of his, his opinion here, you're not going to, as an agency, you can't just lie and say, no, we've, uh, we've, we're not changing our position. It's always been the same. Um, you have to, like, if you're going to explain why you're changing, then you need to acknowledge the fact that it is some kind of change. And agencies can't also can't depart from prior policy without giving any notice. You can't ambush the regulated industry. And you also can't just disregard rules that are still on the books and say, we don't care what the code book says, this is our new rule. So where does this leave us? Well, your takeaway from FCC v. Fox and is that when an agency changes its mind or reverses course on, in a regulation, they do not need to satisfy a court that the reasons for the new policy are somehow better than the reasons for the old one. All they have to show is if the new policy is permissible under its statute, like if they're still operating within the range of options allowed by the statute, and they can articulate some good reasons for the new rule, they don't even have to show it's better, they just have to show that they have some reasons for the new rule, the court is supposed to defer to the agency. This is your big takeaway from this case, what I have on this slide. Okay, um, I just want to note this debate in the case that goes on and on and on I, uh, to the point where I got sick of it um, about whether the FCC did in fact change. Note that the parties and the judges here disagree about the extent to which the FCC had in fact changed its position. The FCC said not very much and the other side said, no, this you've completely changed. And also whether its earlier contrary statements were something that should have been relied upon as official policy or law and whether it's Golden Globe order put everyone on notice. Um, and the Fox, although that's also confusing because the Fox broadcast actually predated the order. Um, if you like quotes from the case, I pulled out one for you that I liked. Um, usually the agency need not always provide a more detailed justification then what would suffice for a new policy created on a blank slate? I really like how Justice Scalia put this part. Sometimes it must. And so here are cases where it would have to articulate more. When, for example, its new policy rests on, upon factual findings that contradict those which underlay its prior policy. In other words, they're gonna, if it, let's say this is a scientific standard and we, they're gonna say our earlier science, it was actually the studies were flawed and now we're, um, using a different rule, or when its prior policy has engendered serious reliance interests that must be taken into account. So if an entire industry 
has been planning around a certain rule, but that's it hasn't been the case. It wasn't the case with these Fox broadcasts. By the way, it, it quotes Smiley v. Citibank, another case that I've made a video about that was really kind of unclear about what it stands for. And so it's ironic that the, I think the, the single clear statement in FCC v. Fox cites Smiley um, as its basis. Okay, let's talk about the dissenting opinions just very quickly. Here's the main point that you need. Justice Breyer um, says that the FCC is an independent agency and therefore should get heightened scrutiny from the courts. And I have like, wait, what? Um, but the majority says that's ridiculous. Independent agencies are sheltered from the president, not from Congress or the courts. Um, both of the dissenting opinions say that the FCC needed to offer better reasons for a change in its policies about indecency. Okay, I know that um, students really like the First Amendment issue, the free speech issues in this case. So just keep in mind, even though I'm focusing here on the administrative law lessons from the case, obviously there's a serious constitutional question here under the First Amendment about the validity of an agency's approach to profanity in broadcast television. Also, there's a question about its rel relevance now that most people are getting their shows and movies through streaming media. Um, this case was remanded and went to the Supreme Court twice. And if you tried to find the case or look up other study aids and um, case uh, briefs about it, watch out because there are actually two cases a couple of years apart, uh, three years apart it, from the Supreme Court that are FCC versus Fox Television. And it's the same case. It just went up to the court twice. So on remand, here's what happened just in a nutshell. The Second Circuit actually addressed the constitutionality of the FCC's regulating indecency and said that you can't do that And in July 2010. And then, so then um, the FCC put out a new order um, again over the, the same uh, billboards festivals and an episode of NYPD Blue that had some nudity in it. And, um, and that one, um, actually they find the stations that broadcast the episode. So they had to play, pay over $20,000 for um, if it had applied. Um, so the FCC had lost, um, and right? So after the, the first win at the Supreme Court, the case I've been talking about, they reissued their orders and um, find the ABC for broadcasting the uh, racy episode of NYPD Blue. And that went to the Second Circuit, which said, okay, the free speech, you're violating free speech. So FCC went, goes back to the Supreme Court. So please keep in mind that there are two decisions. And in 2012, the court decided the reappeal narrowly striking down, down the fines, not for violating free speech, but for being unconstitutionally vague because they were based on a lack of prior notice. It upheld the FCC's authority to act in the interest of the general public when licensing broadcast spectrums to enforce decency standards. In other words, in 2012, the, that FCC v. Fox case, the Supreme Court says the FCC does get to engage in some censorship as long as they're clear and don't ambush people like after the fact, they're not vague, um, and that they won't be in violation of the First Amendment. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. If an agency changes its policies or rules, does it need to articulate more of a reason than it would for adopting a new policy in the first place? A, yes, because it's an independent agency, or B, no, with a few uh, exceptions, like where the par parties relied on the previous policy and um, couldn't have anticipated the change. Hopefully you know the answer to this. If not, you probably gave up on listening to me at some point and you need to rewatch this video. And that concludes our lecture about FCC versus Fox television.